I don't even know where to start. I mean, you, ever uh, since I started shooting F class back in 20, what was it, 2008 or so, you were already at the top of your game and you have been there <laughs> still. Um, so tell me, who is Bob Bach? How did, how did you get started? Well, you know, I've been involved shooting uh, uh, pistol silhouettes and tactical rifles uh, for quite a bit of a time. Uh -huh. And uh, then in 2001 or so, uh, somebody said, hey, that is a new game in time. I said, yeah, what's that? says F class. Said, yeah, F class. What what what's that? It sounded dirty like an F class, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so uh, the guy introduced me to the game and says, like, you know, you need a good rifle. I said, hey, I I have a good rifle. I have a, a 308. He says, well, you know, the 308 is not good enough for F class. I said, well, why not? Oh, well, we need really shooting a thousand yard. And I haven't been shooting a thousand yard. You know, mm -hmm. I was doing tactical shooting, but those are 100 to 300 yard kind of event with a 308. And I like that. It was nice. So I said, well, if we go to a thousand yard, we looked around. I said, well, I can neck it down to 6'5. I had a bunch of brass and all that. So. I got a 6.5 308 or 260 Remington, the same, same uh -huh. thing. And uh, started to shoot that out of my tactical rifle, you know, short barrel, like 24 inches, had a Harry's bipod, uh, magazine fed, and, and all that thing. Well, it, it worked in, in those early days when the target was big. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it was okay. You know, and uh, I was shooting these local matches, and then I got a call from Larry Bartholomew mm -hmm. out of the blue. I didn't know Larry in 2002, and he says, "Well, there is a U.S. team forming. Need bunch of people." We're going to a world championship, F-Class, the first F-Class world championship, going to be in Canada, 2002. Mm -hmm. Would you like to come? I said, okay, I, I can do it. I told him what the rifle I have, and he said, well, it's, it's okay, come. <laughs> come yeah. So that was how I got involved, really, with F-Class. And uh, in the 2002 in Canada, I was a backup. I didn't shoot on the mm -hmm. team, wasn't a shooting member of the team, mm -hmm. but I enjoyed it. It was a nice game and I, I was loving it. And I learned that I need to do more technical work, uh, you know, get a better rifle, get a little bit longer barrel, get a real rest and all that stuff <clears> instead <throat> of uh, my Harry's bipod. Uh, so that's uh, how it started. So your background is engineering, correct? Yes. So how did that, because, you know, you had to, you had to approach the game, you know, at least that's my assumption from your, based on your enge engineering background, you had to uh, approach the game. Once you saw what it really took, did you, did you approach the game any different than everybody else? Or did you just simply do everything everybody else was doing? Well, uh, I don't know how much difference uh, I was doing. Uh, I went on to uh, 65 to 84. Obviously, that was the next step up to reach out there to a thousand yard. Right. Uh, and uh, longer barrel, uh, a better front rest. I actually engineered a front rest, what okay. uh, I took uh, to Africa mm -hmm. in 2005. And uh, that was, 
I'm. <laughs> that was the first front rest that cable adjustable windage. Okay, well, I didn't. I didn't even realize that, but you know, yeah, I, I developed that thing. It doesn't surprise me because I know you have an engineering background. Right. So you know, the the problem is twofold. Uh, one of the problem is that uh, I'm a short guy with a short arm. Mm-hmm. And having this new rifle with 32-inch <laughs> barrels and the front rest is way out there, I just couldn't reach that windage adjustment. Mm-hmm. So I looked around and said, well, I find this speedometer cable in the auto supply store. I bought one of those <laughs> and outfitted this front rest. Uh, I mean, that front rest was probably the cheapest front rest you ever seen. It was a Sinclair windage adjustable top, mm-hmm. but the bottom of it was that green. Yeah, uh, Cal- Caldwell, the Caldwell. Caldwell. Yeah, the Caldwell mm-hmm. bottom. Mm-hmm. And I bored out the center so the Sinclair fits on the top, added this cable, and then I was happy. I mean, that rest is still a very good rest. Uh, it's a what I would call it. It's a travel rest because it's lightweight. Mm-hmm. You know that that whole rest probably weighs uh, six seven pounds, or it can't really be more mm-hmm. than that. It's it did good for me, uh, well f- for me anyway. Uh, so that that was something what I approached a little bit differently than others. Uh, but then, you know, when I was at the matches, people looked at it and said, gee, yeah, what is that? So I told them, it, and uh, people said, well, do you mind if I copy it? No, I mean, yeah. that's what that whole thing is all about. Go ahead, do it. And I told them where you buy the cables and all that. Uh, and uh, that's really uh, the story. Now, you know, I did... My approach for like loading, load development is probably not a great deal different than others. Uh, what I was happy with when we went for uh, to Bisley, I was looking at how we can do a better, more accurate rounds. And I find that the sorting what people were doing were, at least in my opinion, was not the best. So, because I find by experimenting that the overall length matters, on the bullets overall length matters more than the base to ogive. Base to ogives, Burger makes such a good bullets that there is basically almost no variations. But even though it comes out of the same dies, the overall length changes and that point becomes smaller or larger depending on the lengths. And when I looked at out of a standard lot, which varies probably plus minus 15,000, shooting the shortest one and the longest one if your longest one is set up, zeroed in well, you shoot a short one, you get a nine for sure. Is it is that much difference between that length? So maybe that's I did something different than others. So nowadays, I still tell people that if they only had to do one thing, I tell them just do overall length, and and. Most do not believe me. So I'm glad to hear you say this. Oh, uh, yes. That, that's because, right. that, you know, we kept it kind of, quote, unquote, secret. You know, I told the team that at least until we finished with Bisley, don't tell anybody about it. Just, so, just go sort. But that's so it. that's typically what happens, right? Um, and people don't realize this, is that there is a lot of research and development that goes on for the U.S. rifle team because... It's not one person. It's 20 or 30 people, the best shooters in in the United States, that are now sharing information. And, you know, one person, all it takes is one person to have something that works. 
they pass it on to everybody else, that automatically makes the entire team better and of course a better contender. Uh, but at the same time, they have to keep it under wraps because otherwise if it gets out, then now you're helping your opponents, right? Which are the people you're trying to beat. Now, you know, everything gets out eventually. I just right. try to protect that one match. That's right. it. Until it's finished, do not tell people. Right. Uh, and that's where bullet trimming came from. People don't realize the, they don't realize the uh, the connection because now uh, people trim bullets and point and all that stuff, right? But it all started with with uh, possibly you figuring out that you know overall length uh, made a difference, right? I've talked to multiple shooters nowadays, uh, and they say that, and they're right. They said if you measure base to ogive or you measure or you sort by base to ogive or you sort by bearing surface, you're gonna get very slight variation. But if you if you sort by overall length, you're gonna get a big variation. And of course, you're trying to weed out the big variations. Right. So. Uh, and you don't have to throw away. Uh, you know, it's not the point of get, get rid of a bunch of bullets. But if you sort it in groups, as long as in that relay, you're shooting the same lengths. That's then you yeah, find, or, or even if, it, or if even if they're incremental, because they're going to increment by one thousand at a time, right. rather rather than the worst case scenario. If you have plus or minus fifteen thousands, that's that's a total of thirty thousands variance. You would shoot the minus fifteen thousands right next to the plus fifteen thousands. Now right. you have a big variance, right? Right. And right. now you're chasing that that elevation on your scope, and now you're lost, right? You well, just, if if you sort. Uh, not even plus minus a thousand, yeah, plus minus two thousand groups mm -hmm. that will print very well uh, in that relay. And next day, if you have a, a MO that loaded with two thousand longer or two thousand shorter one, that's fine. As long as in that relay you don't mix up things, then right. Good. So I I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you were the tester in not only Team USA but Team Burger. Uh, that you were the you were and, and again this is why I brought up your engineering background because it makes sense that you were the person that was always wondering how can we make this better, right? That, that's just your nature. Um, what? Uh, so let me tell you uh, when I joined the team in 2011. Um, I was talking to Larry Bartholomew. Finally, you know what I mean. It's now I'm I'm on the in circle, right? And and now I'm talking to the likes of Larry Bartholomew, and uh, we're discussing. One day I asked him a question, and I said, "Larry, total neck clearance." I said, "I have found that four thousand. It gives me flyers." Like I said, but I just one day I made a mistake and I cut my neck too thin, and I went to six thousand neck clearance, and I decided rather than throw the brass away, I try it. And all of a sudden, my flyers went away. And he just smiled and he says, well, you're on the team now, so I'll let you know. He goes, we went to, to about 6,000 clearance. Because he said because of you, uh, you guys discovered that more clearance made things more consistent. Uh, is that true? How, long, how did that come about? Well, you know, it really... Uh, we were experimenting, but Mitt Tompkins had, he was also on Tim Burger. Burger, right. And he was driving into our head. He didn't say how much clearance you need, but he said, you got to be able to drop your bullet into a fired case. If it doesn't drop into a fired case, you don't have enough clearance. Mm -hmm. So that's really what started the, the research yeah. in, in my mind, because uh, before I really didn't care. And you see, this is the difference between F class and all the other shootings. You know, you do tactical shooting. It, it's you you're using almost like factory ammo and. Uh, uh, you 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 don't use technology as much as tactics, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. But F class, that's 
particularly now when the target was reduced. This is all technology. It's you got to do it. So, you know, after mid put that bug into our ear, then we started to play with numbers and mm -hmm. made a number of different rumors to open up. And then we find that, yeah, 6,000, it, it helps, it works. Yeah, I, I got there by mistake, but hey, I got there. <laughs> uh, but like I said, it was very, very surprising when I asked Larry. And this is what I tell people, and, and they they have to get on a team. How 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 big of a, a part do you think Team Burger and ultimately Team USA uh, helped you with your development in F class as a, as a shooter? Well, you know, it's uh, I enjoy to be part of the team, and I got. Uh, the information from the other people on the team. See, it's uh, information is always valuable. You need information, ideas. And when you are on the US team, you are part of the best shooters. And that's where best ideas come from. You know, so it, it it makes a big difference to be on the team from that perspective. Not, not only that uh, you push yourself to be a better competitor or a better team member, but also you receiving better information uh, and it helps you your own development. That's well, I think what makes the information better is not only because you can possibly encounter that information elsewhere, but I think a person would be most most likely to dismiss it if it comes from just anybody versus if it comes from people on the U.S. rifle team. You know what I mean? I yeah. think if it well, comes from somebody, there's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation around. You know, the, <laughs> somebody said once, you know. Not everything is true, but you see on the internet. Oh yeah, <laughs> and but, that's very. But like great. I said, when when it comes from somebody who's on the U.S. rifle team, uh, I think it's at least going to give people. At least they're going to try it. I think they're going to be willing to at least stop long enough and think about it to at least try it. And I think that's how they're going to find out that it really does work. Uh, like I said, when I joined the U.S. rifle team. Uh, the person that, that I was pretty much forced to join the U.S. rifle team <laughs> by Mike Downey. Remember Mike Downey? Yes. Uh, he, he was my mentor. He's the guy that took me under his wing and he started teaching me the ropes. And then uh, at the club that I used to shoot at, uh, I shot a 595 at 1,000 yards. And he said, and I set a club record. And he's like, you're joining the U.S. rifle team. And I say, I, I'm not that good. He goes, no, you're good. You're joining the U.S. rifle team. And he, he's, and he called me. Uh, I was on the phone with him, and he, he said, let me call you back. And he hung up. And, of course, this is a, now this is the 2013 cycle, right? And so this is about 2010 or so. So he calls me back, and he said, okay, I talked to Brian Odie. It was Brian Odie, right, the, the, the captain in 2011 or the 2013? Uh, well, he started as the captain, and then Shiraz took over. But anyway, uh, he's like, okay, you don't have any qualifications, but it's okay. They're going to let you try out because the tryout was going to be there in Houston at my club. He says, they're going to let you try out, but then you're going to have to go and either get top 20 at nationals or top three at a state championship. He goes, but you're, you're going to try out. <laughs> so he pretty much forced me to try out. And I did well. I did well, uh, well on the tryouts. And then, as they say, the rest is history. But, you know, that's, I, I just didn't know how good I was or if I was, I didn't know if I was any good. And, and Mike said, yeah, so, so Mike is the one that told me, nope, nope, you're joining the team. And I feel like after I joined the team, that's when my, the knowledge doors just, blew wide open because like i said i had i had all these theories i had all these things i've been testing and see i have a thousand yard range so i just had an idea and i just go test it you know and i just go test That's it nice and uh 
and I had all these things that worked, but I didn't know if it was me doing too much work or, or, or just it was a fluke. So then I would, I would ask people like Larry or Mike Downey or anybody that was willing to answer a question. And uh, I'd say, hey, this is what I found. And they'll be like, oh yeah, that's, that works. We've been doing that. I'm like, great. Or I tell them something and they're like, you know what? We, we never tried that. And they, they'd possibly go try it and then come back to me like, yeah, that works. You know what I mean? And it just- yeah, But you know what, when you're talking about also on the team, what, what is very good about the team that when you have an idea and you do some experimenting, uh, that experiment is bias. I don't care who says what. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, my engineering background is, is a biomedical engineering. I did a lot of stuff, clinical studies and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know that to do one study at one place, it's not as good as multi-center studies, different locations and different people. To have something really reliable and really good, you need to have more than one person to do the testing. Mm -hmm. And if you find somebody who's uh, skeptical about it, ah, that's the best. I tell you, <laughs> that's the best. And I like to do that. When, when I want to prove something what I'm working on, to get somebody involved, tell them a little bit about it. He said, ah, oh, that's no good. I said, hey, let's test it. Why yeah. don't you test it? That's the best guy to test. Because if he goes into it with skeptical and he comes up with, says, hey, it is my result. It really works. Now you know you got something. Yeah, because they were trying to prove you wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's the best thing can happen to you. And sometimes, sometimes they do prove you wrong because, like I said, you, you have your own methods and it may work for you very well for a while and then you're getting into a different environment and the same thing now it doesn't work but if you had it had the idea tested by somebody else in a different environment that is the key for success i think because you I, never know where the next match is going to be where the next environment going to be you need methods that works in all environment if you really want to have a good system i think that's what you need i i agree now let's go back to 2009 so you were the captain of the u.s team back then correct yes how did that come about how did you get to be a captain <laughs> well i don't know who there was somebody after Africa. Larry Bartholomew was the captain in Africa. Uh -huh. And after that, when we came back, Larry said, hey, I did my job, I did my work, I'm happy, but we need to have another captain. And I'm, I'm not sure, S somebody was the captain for 2009 for a very short period of time and uh, something uh, happened so Larry calls me and says hey Bob why don't you do this <laughs> I, said, I can't do that so he kind of talked me into it and says hey do that uh, and uh, John Brewer gave me a very good advice. John said, look, you know, you won't be able to do everything yourself. No way. And uh, you need a vice captain. Pick somebody who's really busy. You need somebody who's a really busy individual because a really busy person will do better for you more effort. And I, geez, geez, what do you mean? I, I mean, I, I thought I picked somebody who's 
uh, stays home and have nothing to do and I have him be the vice captain, then he can put all that effort in and no problem, no conflict. John says, hey, that's not how life is. And John Brewer was a very smart individual. And basically John's theory was, you know, you, you, if you have somebody who has nothing to do, this is really not a most successful individual. Get somebody who's busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it, it, I'm, know, sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that makes sense. Because somebody who's busy, that means they're always hustling, they're always trying, they're always trying this, trying that, they're always doing something. Yeah. They're busy for a reason, because they want to yes. be. Yes, they, they, have, they have the work ethic and all of that. So uh, we were at a match, just, it was at, at the same match, actually, when all these discussions taking place. And uh, I seen Shiraz there. Mm -hmm. He's a busy individual. He's got a business to take care of. So I asked him, can you do that? Would you do this for us? And he looked at that. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm very busy with this business, but uh, okay, I, I, I'll help out. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, that was a very good choice. Uh, Shiraz did a tremendous amount of work, good work, mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I couldn't pull this thing off without him being the vice captain. He, he was just very good. Uh, stuff what he, he does, he does well, very well. Well, that is his... Uh, and, and somebody like Shiraz that's really busy, not only do they know how to get stuff done, they also know how to delegate, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, and, and he had... You know, he had the good resources. The, the, the fact is that uh, I had a vice captain group of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was him. Right. And when, when he needed, he reached into his organization and grabbed somebody who had to get something done. And, and it got done. Right. You know, so we... I, there's no way I could have done it without him. It's uh... so so. You you select Ross as a vice captain. What is it like to lead? Because everybody's type A personality, pretty much, right? Just everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to wants. To, how, what's it like to lead a group of killers? <laughs> let's let's call them killers, because you know they all are. I think you know. Everybody that's willing to be on the U.S. rifle team and, then, and the makes it through the tryouts and makes it through everything. And not only do they make it through the tryouts, they make it at the very top of, of, uh, of the list. What yeah. is it like to lead a group of people like that? It's, it's really not that hard, you know? It's the, the hardest thing is to select the people. And if you select the right people, leading them is, is easy because part of that selection process is not only the group size what they can shoot, because that's not enough, but part of them is the temperament and the, the attitude to be a team member. The team cannot function as uh, 20 individuals going into 20 different directions. But if you pick the people and, and be honest with them, you know, during the tryout, uh, be honest, it says, you know, we're looking at not only uh, your group size, but your ability, your attitude, that's all part of the game. And when you get together that set of people. Uh, 
I didn't find having difficulties uh, with with leading. You got to be honest with them. You know, you you got to lay down the parameters, what's expected, and before they are on the team, they they got to know. They they just want. If you pick people who want to be on the team under those criteria, then your life is easy. It's not that difficult, really. Uh, you know, the, the every day, sure, you, you get difficulties, you get emergencies and this and that, but uh, it's it's not a very difficult job, really. That At least, that's how I feel. Well, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you guys go to go to the world championship uh, 2009 you guys did not what did you guys get bronze or silver silver right okay. silver silver uh, what do you think the cost was what, what could you guys have done different to you know in order to get the gold mm. well you know there was uh, a lot of soul searching about that. Uh, don't know for sure. Uh, one of them is, I, thinking back, is the range knowledge, experience. Bisley particularly is not an easy range to shoot at. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I would do it again, you know, I would send people earlier. Uh, and it's not only the coaches, you know. Sure, coaches are an, an extremely important key to this game. And we did always trying to send the coaches to to have the local local knowledge, right? Uh, but it would certainly help if the shooters also, the more shooters has local experience. Uh, you know, it, it's not only wind calls, but there is verticals in that. And ranges has vertical peculiarities. Mm -hmm. So the more experience you have, the better chance you have of winning and it's definitely part of the issue right I, well i think this goes back to what you said earlier about uh you know because you can send the coaches and then they can pick up possibly on the wind but if the shooters are there and they're shooting then they can possibly identify conditions that give them vertical and then they can relate that information back to the coaches you know what i mean so it's just it's just yeah. a bigger sample size that would possibly help with the outcome so the six fives, I mean, you guys showed up to Bisley with six five two eighty fours. Um, mm. How, <laughs> if you had to go back, would you say let's let's do sevens, or you think it would be just range knowledge? Uh, I think it more range knowledge. Uh, the big magnums, uh, you know, I never been in favor of the big magnums. Uh, in Africa, uh, was 2005 and we came in second there also. So people were pushing about seven millimeter, they thought that seven millimeter may be better. Uh, but the question is whether you lose it on the wind or you lose it on verticals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are other factors. Like if I look back to Africa, uh, the interesting part was not only that they had that seven boo-boo or whatever the name right. that 
cartridge was big mm -hmm. seven millimeter magnum. Mm -hmm. uh, but also they had new barrels. Mm -hmm. And in Africa, we had old barrels. See what, what happened when you look back into what happened in Africa, the laws were such that we were not allowed to take more than one barrel there. For some reason, the Africans considered the barrel as the rifle. Okay. And we had to put serial numbers on the barrels. And by the time the team match came, our rifles were worn out. Mm. Now, uh, you know, I still have on my wall a picture from Africa where the first 10 people in the individual, nine of the 10 were USA. You had good barrels yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I think maybe there was one Africans in the first mm -hmm. ten. Mm -hmm. And then came the team day. Here came the new rifles. And the rest the old rifles day. got older and older. Right. So uh, what we did for Bisley is recognizing that, that that at least was part of the issue. Uh -huh. uh, we were advising people kind of required mm -hmm. that we don't go to Bisley with more than 350 rand or something on the barrels. Mm -hmm. And bring two barrels if you can, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. two good ones. Right. And we pre-selected and pre-qualified the barrels. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that is more important whether at 6.5284 or 7 millimeter magnum. Uh -huh. uh, and we, I don't remember now how many points we lost by, uh, but it, it, I don't think it was much at all. But second place is still not first place, you know. <laughs> it would have been right. nice right. to have first place, but we did not. So the U.S. team won gold on the first first world championship yes is that correct when was that 2000 2002 2002 in canada in canada yes. and we haven't won gold again ever since is that correct that is correct okay we always coming in second yeah uh you know that's not bad but not as good as first <laughs> uh i agree so but um, in, one other thing, if you think about it, other than Canada, the other matches won by home range people. Right. Think about it. Right. Well, except 2013, because <laughs> we were the home range people. <laughs> yeah, 20, that, that's true. Yeah, that that is true that would have been nice actually if if, if, it, if it were true because that means we would have won the gold in 2013. okay but well, let's fast forward to 2013 because you were still on the team at that point right yes now you were a shooting member yes shiraz was captain now we are in our home range we are in raton new mexico whittington center um again uh, at this point now the u.s team has moved up to seven millimeters right yes um and australia shows up with 284s and they just clean house um what do you think happened there i mean because you know we had home range advantage and still couldn't couldn't pull it off uh don't know i i never gone into an analysis to try to figure out why did we lose mm -hmm. the first place. Uh, it's, uh, you know, that that's just the bottom line. I, I haven't looked at with a critical eye uh, 
of why. Right. It is in in a way I don't think that the uh, six five two eighty four is or the seven millimeter is that much better than a six five. Mm -hmm. It it it's just not. Mm -hmm. 65284 is a very good cartridge. Uh, and the Australian proved it. I mean, it's. Well, I think the Aussies won with 284s, 7mm. Or just, 284. It's yes, even. Yeah, 7mm. Uh, as far as I know. Magnum not a Magnum. Uh, as far as I know, they, they, they were not shooting Magnums. Of course, I'm not 100%. But uh, from, you know, from what I heard, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Rod Davis, who is the. Uh, current world champion i'm interviewing him next week and uh i'm gonna see if he if he was on that team in 2013 because i know he was on 2017 because that's when he won the world championship but uh try to get a little more insight as to what they were shooting and and maybe the decisions that were made uh because they won again see they won 2013 and then they won 2017 didn't they or did canada win 2017 no i thought australia won 2017 also in canada uh, it's starting to get hazy now, but <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm getting too old. <laughs> so anyway, Mr. Box. So, uh, I mean, you've had a, you have won the nationals, correct? You are a national champion. Yes, uh, and it was in the seventeen. Twenty seven. Uh, oh no, no, not seventeen. Oh, that was Larry. No, se no, seventeen. No, Larry won in twenty thirteen. Two thousand seven. 2007 you won the seven, long time <laughs> so let's talk about team burger because uh, I, I had a pretty good conversation with jim about that last night and because um, i mean when i started f class like i said 2008 2010 is when i first started traveling outside of texas and and you know got to see you guys in the flesh and you know i had been reading about you guys for a long time but i finally got to see you guys and and we brought a team and of course, Team Burger was there, and everybody knew we're all shooting for second place because Team Burger is going to win, and then everybody else is, you know, second and on, right? So, how did you guys get to be so dominant? Uh, was there? Did you guys have a special, uh, <laughs> special technique or or magic dust or or what? What happened that you guys were so dominant for for a long time? I mean, still, you guys are still pretty heavy contenders. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we worked hard at it. You know, we tried our best to shoot, and uh, you know, Larry picked people for the team, and uh, uh, you know, we just we just tried our best, and we were young then in you know in a in a relative terms when, when <laughs> right. I say when you say uh, Tim Berger was dominant uh, that was in 2007 8 10 yeah uh, you guys I you think know, the truth is that in the last uh, four or five years we getting to be all grand seniors Mm -hmm. And it's not an excuse. I mean, but, but the fact is that we are not the dominant uh, thing today. Well, Unfortunately, I still try the best, but... Uh, I, I think what happened was uh, team shooting wasn't as big back then as it is now. I mean, now team shooting has become a big thing in F-Class. Don't you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, and, and also you have now uh, more, you know, because it was Team Burger and everybody else was pretty much a pickup team, you know. Well, now you have more established teams that are, that are well, no, you had spindle shooters back then and you had uh, uh, long shots. Look, there, there are a lot of good people coming into this game. They are excellent shooters. These new guys are good. Yeah, that that just. What do you think? You know, what do you think? The bottom line is this: new what people, you, fresh blood, good skill, good talent, and. Uh, 
they deserve to win. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And this is why I'm doing this. Like I told you, I, I want to do these interviews because the young guys, they're coming on, you know, they're coming into the sport. And I want them to see interviews with someone like you uh, so they can see what it used to be and the way it is now, right? Because back then, I mean, we didn't have no hybrids. We didn't have no annealers. We didn't have no bullet pointers. We didn't have no sorting tool. We didn't have electronic scales. We didn't have any of that back then, right? And, uh, and not only did we not have that, we didn't have all the information that's available nowadays. I mean, somebody, a new shooter can come on to the sport nowadays and they can say, you know what? I'm gonna get a custom action. I'm gonna get a SEB rest. I'm gonna get a Night Force or March or Coliscope. And I'm gonna get a Brooks, Bardline or Krieger Barrel. And I'm gonna build a 24, shoot 180 grain hybrid burgers. And I'm gonna shoot, you know, either Vitavori N165, 4350, 4831 shortcut and Lapua Brass, that's it, right? They have a really good shooting rifle. Yes. Uh, whereas back then, everybody was experimenting, right? I mean, they were still trying out the the, the, the 6 y 24s uh, Ballard was dipping his toes with the 24. Uh, Berger was, they didn't even have a good 7 millimeter bullet at the time. You guys were shooting VODs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was a lot that nowadays nobody would do in their right mind. <laughs> if they're trying to win, they would not do any of the things that you guys or, you know, even I was doing back then when I started. But when I came onto the scene, that's when things were changing. My first rifle was still a 284, a 65 284, but I only kept that for a couple of years. And then I went to the 284 Shehane, and the 180 Hybrid came came on the scene, and and annealers, and and then John Whitten came out with his bullet pointing system, and you know things just started changing, and they just changed so rapidly, you know. Yeah. Well, you know that's how the story of F class is. It's it's now it's very much a technology driven game. You mm -hmm. got to have the very best equipment, the top-notch, all components mm -hmm. to be winning. Right. Uh, now, you got to have have to have your skills, obviously. Uh, wind reading is, uh, is still probably one of the most important things. But uh, even in the wind reading, it's much easier for a coach to call the wind if the rifle holds sub X ring height. Oh, absolutely. Because the coach has more tolerance. I mean, well, not only that, it's it's for a shooter. It's it's a lot easier to learn wind reading if your if your vertical is really tight because you have accurate feedback, right? You know, then you can compensate or or. But if you're getting flyers, people don't realize the flyers go in every direction, also left and right. And oftentimes you're just chasing that flyer, thinking it's wind, and now you're confused. Well, you know, the, the question always about these flyers that I, I'm doing some 22 mm -hmm. rim fire shooting nowadays, mm -hmm. and you can learn a lot from it. And I'm learning. <laughs> and one of the things that I'm learning is that there is no such a thing as a flyer. Oh. You know, hey, I know I was using the word flyers in all my life. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, the true flyers are that when you know you have flyers is when you have flyer here, a flyer there, here and there. Those are flyers. But a lot of times, people calling it flyers, so they get a bunch of low shots. Oh, mm -hmm. that's a flyer. Mm -hmm. No, it is not. I'm learning that that's not a flyer. 
So what there is, is it? A reason for a flyer is where you you have no reason just just Unpre un un unpredictable. Yeah, it's an unpredictable shot. Unpredictable. So you're saying that, uh, uh, for example, what we would typically call flyer, like a low shot, right? You're saying that it it, it was caused by something in the range that we simply just could not see. Yeah, and, and it may be maybe not necessarily in the range. It may be in your setup, in your equipment. If, if your flyers are in the same direction, don't accept it that, oh, that's a flyer. No, you better start working on it because better find a reason for that. That's not a flyer. That's a defect in something. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Huh. Shut that thing up. Now, <laughs> at the, you, were not, you were not at the Nationals in Indiana, correct? You were not at the Nationals in Indiana? No. The Long Range Nationals. So, let me tell you what I did. I don't know if you're aware of what I did, but I was... I shot pretty well the whole week. I even shot with Jim Murphy one day, and uh, I shot well all week. Uh, I was in on the last day. I was I think I was probably sixth place, sixth or seventh, maybe fifth. I don't I don't remember, but I was up there. I was up there pretty pretty close, and I had one more to go. The conditions it was windy, but it was readable, right? And I thought, okay, this is, it's done. You know, it's, it's easy. My gun was shooting really good. And uh, it was, a, I, I just had my stock re-clear coated. Okay. And I was on relay two and there was only two relays that day. So you know what it is. You, you first go to the pits and then you come back and you set up your rifle and you shoot. And then you, your partner shoots and then you shoot again. So what happens, they allow you to leave the gun on the rest if you choose to because the pits are going to be sealed the whole time so that's what i did um i left my rifle on the rest well everything's set up during prep time i'm just kneeling in front of my rifle because i'm not i mean it's it's set up right and as i'm as i'm looking at it i noticed that my clear coat was getting scratched uh, because of my front rest right it's it's brand new clear coat and i saw it getting scratch marks because of my rest my ears on my front wrist and I noticed that when I was putting grease on my bolt on my bolt lugs right I grabbed some grease on my finger put it on and I that's when I saw that so I put the bolt in there I loosened the ears on the rest I pulled the gun back and I went to just rub it to see if it was deep scratches or you know superficial scratches when I went like that I put grease on it because I had grease on my finger and then I got to thinking, I said, you know what, let me put grease on the other side, put it back in the rest and see how it feels. And I pulled it and it just, it just felt amazing. You know, I greased it and it just felt amazing. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to shoot my string like this. I had vertical that high. <laughs> oh, I mean, I dropped 10 points on that one string and I hadn't dropped, I was probably down 10 points for the whole championship. Oh, it was ugly. Well, I thought it was a dirty barrel. So, of course, I came home and I tested it. Like I said, I have a thousand yard range. I went out there, cleaned off all the grease, and I shot five shots. And uh. it was 4.2 inch group at 1,050 yards. 4.2 inch group, which is how my gun shoots. And I thought, okay, that's how it shoots. I put grease on there, and the group went to about nine inches immediately. Five shots, nine inches, you know, had a flyer over here, or not a flyer, but you know, had one out here, one out here. It's just, just, just a pattern, not a group. I cleaned the grease off again, everything, put it back in the rest, shot another one, back to like a 4.1 inch group. So, and I only had 15 shots from the, from the ammo that I took to nationals, but it was amazing to realize and now that you say this, is there's no such thing as flyers. It's something's going on. Well, that may, I may have proved it by the grease that I put on the rest because it just went everywhere. I think you just did. It was, you know, that's, it was ugly, Bob. <laughs> because we were on different 
I remember years ago, uh, we were in Phoenix and people got some verticals and they say, oh, this range has verticals. Mid just says, no, nah, range has no verticals. Hmm. Something else. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, when the range has the problems, I don't think those range problems um, can be limited to one 20 foot wide strip on the range. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the range has problem, other people are going to have the same problems. Well, uh, well yeah. at least in your close vicinity. Right. You well, know, like, maybe like, and like, position. Well, that's usually what I do. If I have a high, high shot, I immediately look at my neighbors see if they also had high shots. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if they did, then it's like, okay, it was range induced. For example, you go to Raton and you get on the low end where the, the berms are really high, the 800, the 900 and 800 yard berm are really high and you have a headwind, you're gonna have vertical. But uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, it's not gonna be just your lane. It's gonna be your neighbors as well. But I have seen that happen where, you know, somebody will have a high shot and then everybody next to them, you know, five or six or eight targets will all go high, you know. Right. But so what What would you do nowadays if you're shooting and then you have a high shot? Like, what would you, and it's only you, you're having vertical. You would, you would, instead of blaming the range, you would just go and try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Double check all your equipment, your rest, everything. That's what I do. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, I was talking to Larry one day, 2017 at the Nationals, and we're at the award ceremony, and uh, I was taking pictures, and I was just talking to him, and uh, he walked, you walked by, and then uh, I told... Uh, I told, uh, I said something to Larry, and then Larry said something, you know, we're just having a conversation, and I said, well, yeah, so you do realize Bob Bach invented the ultrasonic toothbrush, right? He goes, no, no, he didn't, and then he asked you, he said, Bob, did you invent the ultrasonic toothbrush, and you said, yeah, and he goes, how come you never told me that, and you went, eh, <laughs> so why, why doesn't more people know that, you just try to keep that under wraps? Because, I mean, I have one. I no, have multiple. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not a bragger or, or something. Well, uh, I mean, you just, but I mean, this is how, I mean, somebody that invents the ultrasonic toothbrush, um, I figured, I'm sure you have been more of, a, of an influence to F-Class than you probably give yourself credit for. Because, you know, like I said, you know, bullet trimming is now popular. And, you know, you're the one that came up with the, you know, the, the figured out that, uh, you know, overall length matters. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's probably a lot of things that you came up with. Like I said, when I was talking to Larry, he's the one that said that you, you came up with the, with, and he told me about multiple different things that, uh, that you had came up with. <laughs> and he's the one that said, he said, Bob Bach is a tester in the team. He said, he's, he's, he's the one that does all the testing. I don't know how much of that was true, but I, I kind of tend to believe <laughs> just talking to you. Yeah. You know, it, it, the, the truth is that we, you can call it group testing or, or whatever, but, you know, we subscribe to that thing that if you have an idea you want to prove, you got to have more than one person who do and test that thing. And uh, we always did. That's part of one team burger things that we were testing each other's ideas and proven or disprove it. Right. Uh, you know. So, so how did the ultrasonic toothbrush come about? Just, just one of those things. Like, were you in the in the? Well, I, I've been with uh, General Electric Medical Systems for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I ran the ultrasound division 
manufacturing in California. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I, I had ideas about what I learned what ultrasound can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and you obligated to disclose any ideas to the company you work for. That's part of your contract, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I told them about, and the company said, yeah, that's fine, but we're not interested. We're not in the consumer business and, and all those things. Mm -hmm. Just not interested. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I do it myself? I got a clearance. Mm -hmm. That company has no interest. So I went and developed it on my own. Mm -hmm. And I started a little company, uh, which I ran for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. We were making everything in the US. And uh, then I sold the company and I retired mm -hmm. early, mm -hmm. which was probably the best decision of my life. You know, it's sure I could have made a bunch of more money and but no freedom and no time and no nothing. Uh, so I did that. And then the unfortunate thing was that the people who bought it, they took everything to China, mm. so they can produce it for less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had no control. Right. That. But uh, unfortunately, you know, and I, I, I still don't like it. But that's how a lot of things happens nowadays. Right? Well, yeah, they I mean, looking at the buck that I can do it for make more money if I take it to China, cheap labor, and all that. Yeah. So how, when, when did you uh, come up with that ultrasonic uh, toothbrush? It was in uh, 1988, 89. How long was the development process from, from, you know, from the time you got your clearance to the, to the, to the time you rolled out the first one? Oh, it, it took it took three years to get it to get the patents and get it through the FDA. Uh, it took three years, so mm -hmm. we started to roll out the product in, if I recollect correctly, about ninety three, mm -hmm. ninety two, ninety three. That's when we put it on the market. Uh, then I sold the company in 2000. Okay, so you ran for about seven years. Well, you had the company for about 10 years, right? Because you yeah, probably... 10 years, including the development. And... Mm -hmm. Was it an instant success? Like, did, did it take any, any, uh, any uh, I'm going to say, uh, changing people's minds as, as, as about ultrasonic, or was it an instant? No, no, got... and there is. It's, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding with uh, ultrasonic. It's uh, uh, people still don't know the difference between ultrasonic and sonic. And, uh, you know, nowadays, every toothbrush says sonic, is sonic, this, sonic, that. Mm -hmm. And uh, people think that it's all ultrasonic. What is the difference? Oh, it's a huge difference. The, the difference is that ultrasound penetrates deep into the tissues. Sound does not. Okay. And so our clinical studies were always far superior to other toothbrushes. And that's because we impacting bacteria. Uh, Are there any ultrasonic toothbrushes out there? Right now? No. Wow. The company who bought my stuff, they went busted in this 2007-2008 uh, fiasco. Mm. 
they went bankrupt. Hmm. And then. Uh, wow, that's that's very interesting. Well, what would you tell a new shooter? Somebody just super excited. You know, they they want to get into F class. They want to shoot long range. Then they want to get you know to the top of the game as fast as possible what, what, what would you tell them what would your advice to them be what should they do what should they focus on well you know there's two things one of them is the the relatively the easy ones is to build a good equipment and i'm saying easy because ah. the information is available Right. You got to work at it, find it, but it is there. Mm -hmm. uh, without the good equipment, you're not going to be on the top. Okay. And then the hard part is learn the wind. Right. I mean, to, at least to me, that's the hardest thing. Uh, I, I, I never learned the wind good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any any anything that you have learned about the wind that has possibly gotten you through, you know, to the top in some matches? Is are you a, are you a mirage reader or, or a flag reader? Number one. Uh, I'm flag reading. I never got comfortable enough with mirage. Mm -hmm. And uh, if. If I shoot fast, I'm one of those fast shooter guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a good day, I'm doing good, <laughs> you know? But uh, with the fast shooting, uh, sometimes you really get caught. Just, right. You know, that, that's, that's a disadvantage of uh, uh, the shooting too uh. fast call it too fast you know yeah fast enough that 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 you don't catch a wind change or something yes because you're focused I, on I trying miss, to shoot fast right yeah. i and it's it's not necessarily because i'm shooting fast maybe i just i just don't know the wind good enough and uh, i'm i'm trying to learn that now with shooting 22s you know the, the old thing, the whole life cycle mm -hmm. of everything is the young kids, young adults shooting 22s, and then we grow up, compete, getting into big bores. And when we're getting really old, we revert to our childhood. Yeah. Not only mentally, yeah. but then we go back to shooting 22s. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what happens is this, seriously. Uh, right now, I'm in a stage where I'm looking at F-class, high power F-class. And one day that I was really tired. I calculated it and I said, Jesus, I'm taking 75 pounds to the line. Mm -hmm. I hustle 75 pounds to set it up there. That's just too much. Mm -hmm. So I looked at shooting 22 because mm -hmm. I can shoot 22 F class, mm -hmm. taking an 18 pound rifle with the front rest included mm -hmm. is a a good bipod, mm -hmm. a small rear bag, and the ammo in my ah. pocket. <laughs> and <laughs> you don't have to reload. Fucking got the ammo. So I'm enjoying it. And you don't have nah. to reload. Nah, for, don't have to reload. That's true. Right. But I'll tell you, the wind is much more difficult. Really? Than wow. in hyper. Oh, yeah. It's, so it forces me to learn. And I think I'm starting to learn the wind better since I fooling with the 22s because you gotta pay much more attention to it. 
Well, you know what you're doing now. You, you you're gonna want. Jim told me the same thing. So now I'm. I'm looks like I'm gonna be building a, a 22 F class rifle. <laughs> oh, you you you'll enjoy it. It's it's a nice game. Yeah, for sure. You know that's that's the early part of the game. It's like F class big ball were in 2005 or that area. I mm -hmm. think that's probably where the Rimfire F class is today. Mm -hmm. It's in development. Right. Right. It's yeah. Well, I will try it. I, I'll, I'll let you. I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> Well, Mr. Bach, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I know you were a little hesitant to do this, but I am so glad you did. Uh, I know this is going to help a lot of people. I know it helped me. I mean, all these conversations that I've been having lately with with some of you are just just amazing. You know, they've been helping me more than you than you think, and I'm I'm hoping they help a lot others like they're helping me. Well, I hope it was useful or oh. will be useful for some of the young guys. Oh, I think it'll be useful for everyone. <laughs> Again, thank you very much. And uh, are you are you going to the team match in Phoenix in a couple yes. of weeks? No, no, not in a couple of weeks. Southwest uh, National. signed up for the Southwest National. So I should be there in February. February. Okay, I will see you then. Okay, Eric. Thank, thank you. you much. Take care. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And I Tonight I'm